to commit to a little crazy when you're sawing wood. And you've got a lot of control over what Mother Nature's doing to your wood once you know some of the secrets. Thanks for visiting our sawmill. Hey folks, Robert Milton coming back at you from the Hobby Hardwood Sawmill channel. It's cold out here. The wind is blowing, temperature's down, humidity's down. With this kind of weather right here, certainly what I'm gonna do to this pack of wood would be different than what I'm gonna do to the same pack of wood in the summertime. I figured what the heck, might as well, might as well bring you along with my thought processes. I waited until this week to saw these logs up because it's cold and cold meets the criteria for what I want this, how I want this lumber to air dry and how I'm gonna manipulate it. I want it done right and this is the week to do it. So I'm sawing it up. So there is a lot to properly air drying lumber. If you like to make things simple, stack it up, put it outside, come back a year from now, it's going to be dry. It'll also probably be full of bugs. It may have surface checks. It'll have end checks. It'll be warped. It'll be twisted. Maybe sticker stained. It may be enzyme stained. Uh, maybe honeycombed. That's always a good one. Uh, it just depends on what you're going to be using the wood for. If you're going to be putting it up on the side of a barn, if it's warped or twisted, you're going to be pulling it up with nails anyway or screws, so who cares, right? If you're going to be trying to sell this high-grade hardwood, yeah, it makes a difference. Air drying is taught as a stepping stone for when you get a kiln, but the reality is more of a fundamental foundation of what you're trying to learn how to do. So, so air drying is not a step to skip. It's not a step to gloss over. It's not a step to get lost in the weeds either, because after all, air, wood, dry. You drive down the freeway and you go too fast, sooner or later, cops gonna catch you and bad things gonna happen. There's a lot of things that there are limits for. Every species of wood, based on its thickness, has what's called the maximum allowable moisture removal rate or maximum moisture removal rate, which is the total amount of moisture that a board can lose in a 24 hour period before it starts to degrade. It's, and I've done that. I remember one of the first times when I first got a sawmill, I can't even, a few decades ago, I sawed up some of the prettiest red oak you've ever seen in your life. I mean, this stuff was gorgeous. And I stacked it and I did all this stuff and I put it, I put it right here where this pack of walnuts sits. And in two days, I had ruined that entire load of wood. I mean, I had cracked it so bad that I'm out here like looking at it going, oh my gosh, what have I done? I'm starting to cuss so bad, low flying birds were falling out of the sky. I had ruined this pack of my favorite, bestest new wood due to my own inexperience, big time. Ruin the whole pack. Fast forward 20 years, in the exact same spot, I've got a pack of high dollar walnut and it's doing great. Look how pretty this stuff is. And it's obviously been out here more than two days. Cause look, there's an acorn head on it where a squirrel's been crapping on it probably. Look at that. What do I know now that I didn't know back then where in this very spot I ruined a pack of red oak You'll notice it's not under cover. Get that question all the time. Can you put it outside? Well, yeah. Should you put it under a shed? Sometimes. Should you do this? Yeah. What about that? Well, I guess. Because what I didn't realize at the time that I've learned now is a lot of what I was taught about air drying wood 
kind of gets to the outer edges of the understanding of the whole process. But until you understand the maximum moisture removal rate of your species and your thickness, you really can't make any judgment calls about where is the proper place to dry your wood without ruining it. This is real world. Uh, remember, if you go to our webpage or something, you'll, you'll read up. We sell to some of the highest grade lumber buyers in the country. I have people drive 12 and a half, 13 hours to buy our wood. Tars made in Nashville from stars that you've listened to made from our wood. I got some pretty cool logs I'm gonna saw. It's a rainbow poplar. The last thing I wanted to do was to saw it up two weeks ago when the temperature was hot. A lot of people think sticker stain is simply due to moisture being trapped under the wood and that is one of the reasons we use these cool fluted stickers but the reality is there's another one that's almost as bad and it's called enzyme stain you see it a lot on improperly air dried maple and that is from the sugars in the wood being exposed to high temperatures high moisture and the enzymes oxidize and make the wood turn color and you go well, i've never heard of I've never heard of enzyme stain. Have you ever bitten into an apple? You bite in an apple in the summertime and you look at it and it's nice and fresh and clean. You put it down, you pick it up like a minute later and it's starting to turn brown. It's exactly what happens to the sugars in some species of wood in the summertime. So if you're gonna saw those species of wood in the summertime, you really better know what you're doing. Imagine trying to keep the apple from turning color in the summer, in July. Some people go, well, why don't you just put it in your kiln? Well, then you won't have any degrade. The problem is that in some species, the maximum moisture removal rate is so slow, that wood's gonna stay in your kiln a long time. And if you have a business running an operation where you've gotta put out a lot of lumber, well, guess what? You can't afford to have your kilns tied up so sometimes in many species you can manipulate the air drying system that you're using through various techniques to get to drying right at the maximum moisture removal rate so it's drying as fast as the wood can dry out in the air most times in a kiln when you got green wood off the mill you're having to slow it down which is burning time and energy now you're probably going to ask um, Gee, if maximum moisture removal rate, if wood murmur is so important, where do I find this out? She printed these out for you guys. I was gonna show them to you, and then I realized that would be too easy. Y'all call me the sawmill professional. I'm gonna do a little bit of homework. <laughs> the reality of this is you need to have these memorized. For whatever species you're sawing, you need to have these memorized. Let me, let me repeat that you need to memorize let me people say i talk slow i'm gonna say memorize this is like the fundamental of the fundamental so anyway let's let's see what we got here oh wow this is impressive huh um look here they are <laughs> it's like teasing um I'm not gonna tell you all these just cause I'm ornery, but let's pick one. Most of you guys do saw oak, red oak and white oak. The maximum moisture removal rate in a 24 hour period for red oak is 3.8%. And that's for four quarter. Basically round that up to 4% for one inch. If you lose more than 4% moisture per day on red oak, you will crack that wood. You will surface check that wood. You will damage it. You will be making firewood, period. White oak, the maximum moisture removal rate for four quarter is two and a half percent. I actually like to round that down to two percent because I've cracked wood at two and a half percent. Let's talk about thickness now. If you're doing white oak and you go from four quarter where you're basically at two and a half percent and you go to eight quarter now just call it one percent 
that's not much moisture removal rate per day. So let's just show you how things are different, how things can be different. Let me just walk you around real quick. Um, this area right here we set up as a pre-staging in walnuts has a pretty high allowable moisture removal rate, so I wouldn't do any damage to it. So I got it down here on the gravel, and it's dried quick, because I need to get this stuff out pretty fast. And yes, I do have some kilns, but there's no way I'm gonna put green walnut in my kiln and waste all that energy and time uh, trying green walnut in a kiln. That's just foolish. You'll notice how much wood I have drying right here? Nada because this spot, even though it's only 50 yards from that spot, is a horrible place <laughs> to air dry wood. I've learned that through experience. Now, yes, if I had no other place to go, no, I would not just, no, I wouldn't. This is the wrong place to dry, air dry wood. You don't put it here. Um, it will ruin wood. So I stack up my farm implements here. Let's walk up to the house. I'm going to show you something. So I have a carport, open-sided, and what's under it? Is it my two high-dollar pickup trucks? No! It's my lumber. Some of it anyway, because this is probably one of the best places on my property to air dry wood. So instead of my trucks being parked in, I got, I got it slammed full of wood. I got it as full as I can get. Open-sided shed blocked by the house from the north wind for some of this species is the best way to get it. I get a good southerly breeze. It's protected from the southern sun most of the time. This is my cherry and walnut spot. It loves it. My trucks, they're jealous because they're outside. You got to commit to a little crazy when you're sawing wood and trying to dry it. I mean, you got to do what's best for the wood. Now, we have 150 acres here. I got buildings all over the property. Some that we put up, some put up by previous owners. And every single one of them, if it can hold wood, has wood under it. Each building has its own special species that it dries best. And you may think there may be a little bit of voodoo or magic going on here, but no, basically it comes back to those original fundamentals. You don't necessarily have to do it that way, but if you've got the space and you've got the crazy, which I do, um, then you'll find places where certain species or all your species dry really fast, really clean, defect free. And you'll most likely also find places where the opposite's true. And so there's, there's a mill not too far here. They specialize in white oak. And uh, they do a six million board foot a year. And again, when I first started, I struggled with a lot of this. And this is one of the reasons I'm making this video for you guys. Try to keep you from struggling as much as I did. So I was having trouble with thick white oak. I already told you why. The physics say thick white oak is not gonna dry in North Alabama in the summertime without cracking. Well, I had, a, I had a meeting schedule with their people, their manager. They got two million at any time stacked up, trying not just white oak, but mixed hardwoods. I said, how can, how have they figured out how to do it? And I haven't. So we had a big meeting, went down there and the meeting was a bust basically, because when I walked through the yard, sure enough, their white oak had surface checks in it. And that's when I realized you can't fight the physics. I asked them about it, about the air drying surface checks and their answer was typical. We send it overseas, what do we care? <laughs> They're paying for it. Not our problem, it's their problem. That's not the way I do business. And that's when we came back and said, okay, I need to start looking into this. So just because it's a big business doesn't mean it's doing it right, but there's no reason for you not to be able to do it right simply because as a small business, you have, you have access to the same research material they do. And if you're one of the stick it and set it type guys, person, that's fine. People do what they need to do for their own business or for their own personal use. That's cool. Give me, if you don't mind, uh, send me some comments, uh, questions, stuff like that. Please hit the like and subscribe button. So let's get to sawing and uh, we will see you guys 
next week. Thanks for visiting our sawmill. Click on the links above to see more of our videos.